All right, 8th Calc class, we are going to uh, take a look at the 2.2 part B. Um, so some more derivative rules, some shortcuts, but these ones are going to involve um, some sine and cosine trig functions, also the derivative of e to the x, which is very simple, um, some rates of change, and then some equations of tangent lines. All right, so as we go through this, um, it's best, I'm going to just say, you know, you should try to memorize these, but there is a little bit of a, a trick that I think is helpful for trying to remember um, derivative of sine is cosine and that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And here's, here's what I, a drawing that I saw one time and I think it makes a lot of sense. So if you remember from trigonometry, um, the x coordinate represents the cosine of a function. So I'm going to put cosine of x there and the y coordinate represents the sine of a function. So I'm going to put sine of x on the y axis. Now, so this was the positive x-axis, positive cosine, positive y-axis, positive sine. And then if I go over here, I'm going to write this as negative cosine of x because it's the negative x-axis, and then I'll put negative sine of x here, okay? So as we do derivatives, okay, so if we move around this um, coordinate plane in a clockwise direction, that would be giving us the derivative. So as I move around this, the derivative of sine of x gives me cosine of x right here, okay? And then as I, if I were starting here with cosine of x and I want the derivative of that, negative sine of x. So as I move like this, this direction is giving me the derivative of the previous, right? Like that. So as I continue, and then if I were to take the derivative of negative sine of x, that would obviously, that would be negative cosine of x. The derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. If I were to do the derivative of negative cosine of x, that would give me back to positive cosine, or sorry, positive sine. But this little, you know, if you can remember to draw this, you know, just with cosines on the x-axis, positive, negative, and sines on the y-axis, if you rotate around this clockwise, it'll always give you the derivative of the previous function that you had written there. So that's just a little trick for remembering it. Okay, um, first thing it says, and I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time, I'll just kind of walk you through this, but the proof of the derivative, so I mean, we can just tell you that's the answer, but these can all be proven. Most of them we won't prove, but some we can we can show the, the limit definition of the proof. So if my function originally is sine of x, and I wanna find the derivative by the limit definition, right? Remember that when we did that limit definition, it's going to be, you know, f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x, right? And so since our function is sine of x, we'd have sine of x plus delta x minus sine of x all over delta x. So that's our kind of our um, difference quotient, you know, and that was how we set up our limit definition of a derivative. And we're finding the limit as delta x approaches zero on that. Now to evaluate, okay, we can't just plug in zero because that doesn't work. It gives us zero over zero. When we start doing these trig functions, there, you learned a lot of identities back when you took trigonometry. And the sign of an, an addition, there was a sign sum formula. If you recall that, it went sine of A, cosine of B, plus cosine of A, sine of B. And that's really what we've done here. We've expanded this, um, this sine sum to sine of x, which would be like your a or your alpha, and then the second angle would be your b or beta. So sine of x, cosine of delta x, and then we go plus cosine of x, sine delta x, and then we still have the minus sign here, and it's all over delta x. Okay, now, that looks like a big mess, but if we kind of simplify a little bit, so follow me back up to the top here. Um, so if we take these pieces individually, and if I, if I were to pull Okay, so this part here and then the minus sign at the end, I've grouped those together and factored out a sine of x because that was in common. So I pulled the sine x out of that and then I was left with cosine delta x and then when I factored the sine out of this term, that's why I have a minus one there. Okay, and then it's all over delta x. And then I'm gonna take this piece right here and I'm left with cosine x, sine delta x over delta x and that's what I've got as, whoops, as the second piece right there, okay? Okay, so that's what I have left here. So this was the cosine x, sine delta x over x. That's what was left over after I factored out. You know, I grouped these two together and factored out a sine of x. Now the reason for that is because now there were a couple of those special limits as you know, as your x value is approaching zero. When we had cosine of x minus one over x, that had a value of zero. And so that's why I kind of grouped that one like that. 
and the, the sine of x over x, so you remember that one is the limit as x approaches 0 was 1. And now, so those were delta x's now in this instead of x, but same, same concept. So I can evaluate this limit, make it 0. I can evaluate this limit, make it 1. And now I'm left with sine of x times 0 plus cosine of x times 1, which just leaves me with the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. So that's the, the limit definition of how we get the derivative of sine of x. And cosine could be done in a similar way. Okay, but the best thing is just to have that, that knowledge memorized. Or, you know, if you, this is always a good thing to draw out when you're learning it. I like um, using that. Okay, so as we do these derivatives here, um, we know that derivative of sine is cosine, so y prime or dy dx, derivative of y with respect to x, would be 2 cosine x. Okay, that's all there is to it. This would be dy dx, and the derivative of sine, remember, is negative cosine. Right? Derivative of sine is, um, oh, sorry, my bad. Derivative of sine is just cosine. And so if we do this one, we could just say it's cosine of x over 2, or 1 half cosine of x. Either way is fine. And for this one, dy dx. Um, so we're going to do the derivative of x, which is 1, and then the derivative of the cosine of x. Now that's one's your negative sine of x. Okay? And that's all there is to that. Okay. Differentiating e to the x. This is the easiest derivative. It's its own derivative. e to the x, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That's why this Euler's number is kind of a kind of a special number in a way. Um, so there is a calculator activity I'm not going to go through with you, but it just kind of shows how we could um, calculate the derivative at any point, and it's always going to be that same value that you know e to the whatever that x power is. Um, okay, so for each of these, pretty straightforward dy dx, 5e to the x, well, it's still 5e to the x. Right here, um, what do I have on there? That's just a 1. Okay, dy dx, so if I have e to the x there, that derivative is e to the x. The derivative of minus 4x is just going to be minus 4, so that would be my answer. And for part c, uh, dy dx would equal 7e to the x, that doesn't change. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, and so that changes to a plus sine x right there, okay? All right, so some rates of change is what we're going to look at next. So a, a lot of these have to do with position velocity, and then we'll get to, like, acceleration as well. Um, if a billiard ball is dropped from, from a height of 100 feet, its height, s, so that's its position, at a time t is given by this formula, so it's negative 16t squared plus 100, where, excuse me, where s is measured in feet and t is in seconds, okay? So when we're finding these average velocities, remember, for an average rate of change, we need two input values, two x values, and then we're basically just finding the slope between those two. So when I input 1 into this function, I get 84 as, a, as an output, so at, after one second, its height is now at 84. It started at 100, now it's at 84. After two seconds, it's going to be at a position of 36 feet, okay? So we're just going to do the slope between those two, y minus y over x minus x. I get negative 48 uh, feet per second. Remember, it's, it's feet, fit change in feet on top, change in seconds on the bottom, so feet per second. Those would be the units, okay? So that's my rate of change. It's always good to think about your units because that helps you determine... And what is it that I've found? Well, I'm taking a difference in positions, which is feet, and the difference in seconds on the bottom. So if I'm dividing feet by seconds, that's a that's a speed or a rate of change, right? Okay. Uh, similarly, now you can kind of see what they're doing. They're taking this interval and making it closer and closer to 1. So we went from between seconds 1 and 2, and now we're going between seconds 1 and 1 and a half. And so same process. I input the 1, I get 84. I input the 1.5, I get 64. Do my difference in my slope formula, I get negative 40 feet per second. And as I get even closer to just the one second mark, so I'm doing from 1 to 1.1, 84, and then that gives me 80.64. Doing the slope on that gives me negative 33.6 feet per second. Okay, so 
what we're trying to do, it looks like, is we're trying to zero in on what is that instantaneous rate of change at time one second. So after the ball's been falling for exactly one second, you know, we're getting closer and closer to what the actual speed is at that time, okay? Now it says, what do you notice about the sign of each of these answers? And, you know, just with plugging in those numbers, we have negative numbers on each of those, right? They're negative slopes. And so we would say they're negative, and why would that be? Well, what you know about um, these type of application problems is that velocity is a, is a vectored number, so it has a sign. And so because it's falling downward, it would make sense that the, the velocity is negative. So it, the ball, I guess, is falling down, indicating the, the speed is, or the velocity is negative because it's falling down. Okay, now for part C, it says find the instantaneous velocity at each of the following times, right? Instantaneous, okay, so the difference here. Average velocity does not involve a derivative at all. It, it, you just take that position function, you take two input values, two time inputs, and then you, you create a slope, you create a velocity by dividing those out, okay? Now, when we do instantaneous, what that means is you're gonna now, instead of putting in two input values, you're only putting in one, but you're putting it into a different function. Well, remember, we called the derivative of a function the slope finder. And slope is synonymous with rate of change, right? Speed, in a way, right? So we're going to find s prime, so the derivative of position, which is equal to the velocity. So I like to see this notation, stating that s prime of t is the same thing as v of t, the velocity with respect to time. Okay, those, are the, those mean the same thing. Okay, and this shows you how you're getting velocity by taking the derivative of the um, position function. Okay, so that is going to be, when I, you know, so up here, just the exponent rule, right? Multiply the 2 times the negative 16, take away the power there, and then the constant just disappears because that's 0. So I'd get negative 32t. That's my function to find instantaneous rate of change here. So I just multiply by negative 32. So if I'm going to find v of 1 or s prime of 1, all I do now is just plug 1 into this function, negative 32 times 1, negative 32 feet per second, okay? And we could see when I was calculating these average rates of change, when I was getting real close to that one, that's pretty close to what I was getting there, right? But you know, this would be the exact, all right? And so now that I have this function, um, v of 1.5, I have to multiply that by by negative 32, and that would give me, what would that give me? 32 times negative 1.5 would be negative uh, 48. So negative 32 times 1.5 would be negative 48 feet per second. And time, at time two seconds, v of two, negative 32 times 2 would be negative 64 feet per second. Okay, so note the difference. These are really important differences. Average velocity, you can use the position function and then just plug in your two input values, do the slope, that's your average. Instantaneous, you're only plugging in one value into the derivative of your position function. Okay. Okay, next problem, it says at time zero, a diver jumps from a platform that's 32 feet from the water. The position of the diver is given by this function, and where S is measured in feet, time is measured in seconds. When does the diver hit the water? Okay, so hitting the water would imply that we, um, our position is zero. So we're starting at a position of 32, and we go down to the water. At, you know, when we're at, in the water, now, when we hit the water, then our position is zero, right? And I suppose it's, how, I don't know, how he's jumping or whatever. If it's just, you know, feet are here, now feet are here. So we're down to position zero. So I would put in zero for S, which is my position. And then it looks like I'll have a quadratic equation to try to solve to get the, the time when this is going to be happening. Okay, so 
So I'm going to try to solve that. It looks like I maybe need to factor out a greatest common factor. So I'll factor out negative 16. And then I'll have t squared minus... <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Minus t, and then this would be minus 2. Okay. So negative 16, and I've got... I think this factors into what? t minus 2 and t plus 1, I think. And so these are equal to 0. And so my t equals 2. Now over here, this would be negative 1. And that really doesn't make any sense because you can't have a time of negative 1. So it looks like 2 seconds. At t equals 2 seconds. That's when we're hitting the water. OK? Now, next question, follow up. We know it took 2 seconds for him to hit the water. What is the velocity? at impact. So at a specific point in time, at time two seconds, how fast is he going? Or what's his velocity? So let's use our velocity function, which is the derivative of the position function. So if I take the derivative of that, s prime of t, which we know is the same thing as v of t, okay, then I've got negative 32t, and then plus 16, and that would be all I'd have because the constant would disappear. Okay, so if I do that, so that means v velocity at time 2, so v of 2, negative 32 times 2 plus 16. And so that's negative 64 plus 16, which is negative 48 feet per second. So that's my velocity at when he impacts the water. Okay. Okay, so we, we uh, figure out how long it takes for him to hit the water, 2 seconds. What's the velocity at that time, that specific time? Then we find the velocity function, our slope finder, our derivative, and then we plug that 2 in. Okay? All right. So next thing, we're going to write a couple of equations of tangent lines. Okay, so what we're going to use is basically it's the point-slope form of a line. Remember y minus y sub 1 equals slope times x minus x sub 1. I just moved the y sub 1 over here. That's usually the way they give the answers in these multiple choice questions, they're almost always in this form, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write it like this. Okay, so it says write an equation of a tangent line to the function at the given point. Okay, so a tangent line. All right. So it means that what what we want to do is remember, like when we find a a slope of a tangent line, well, we we need to find the instantaneous slope because it's at a specific point on this curve. In this case, this is a parabola, right? So we want to find the derivative first, right? So I want to do f prime of x, and that's going to be 1 minus 4x, right? But then what I want to do is I want to find, okay, this is a slope finder, right? This finds the slope at any x-coordinate of a point that's on this graph, right? So we want, we're talking specifically about this point. It has an x-coordinate of 1, right? The y-coordinate at this point doesn't matter that much until we need to write the equation of the tangent line. Then we need that y-coordinate. But what we want to do then is we want to find the slope when x is 1. So we've got to plug a 1 into this. Okay, And so that's my, my f prime of 1, my slope at that point is going to be uh, negative 3. Right? That's my slope of the tangent line at this point on this function. Okay. It says over here a common mistake, um, and this is said example of 9, but it was 10, um, is to think that the slope of the specific tangent line is this, this whole equation, but you have to plug it in. It's saying it's important you have to plug that in to get the actual value. Okay? Now, this is, an x, this is your x sub 1, this is your y sub 1, so our slope is, we just found that to be negative 3, and then we say x minus the x value, which would be minus 1, and then plus the y-coordinate, which would be, whoops, put equals. And then it would be plus your y-coordinate of minus 1, so that we just say minus 1. Okay, so this would be your equation of your tangent line, right? So x sub 1, y sub 1, those go into your equation like this, okay? In your slope, you find that by taking the derivative and then plugging in the, the x-coordinate that you need to. That's your slope at that specific point, okay? Um, there's another example here. I'll just talk through it quick. Um, now here, they, you know, they only gave us the x-coordinate, which is what we needed. So we need to do the derivative of this 2 square root of x, right? So it would be 2x to the 1 half. That's the way I'd write that first, so that you can apply the exponent rule. Multiply the 1 half times the 2, and so that's why there's no coefficient anymore, because 1 half times 2 is 1. 
and then we take away 1 from the 1 half, which leaves negative 1 half. Okay, so probably 1 over x to the 1 half, or 1 over square root of x. Okay, now when we find f prime of, of that, right, f prime of 1, because we're doing it at 1, we would plug a 1 in there, it'd be 1 over square root of 1, my slope is 1 there. Okay, so my slope goes here, right, just like it did on this one. So I'm still using that, you know, y equals m times x minus x sub 1 plus y sub 1. That's your point slope form of a line. We're used to doing y equals mx plus b, which you can do, but usually they don't, they don't do it. They leave it just like this. They don't simplify it into y equals mx plus b. So I would get used to using this form of the line, okay? That's the point slope form. So your x and y coordinates go here and here, okay? And okay, so they didn't give us a y coordinate, so we have to plug in, you know, they said when x is 1, well, if I put a 1 in there, my y coordinate would be 2. So I need both of those. So I've got slope times x minus x coordinate plus the y coordinate right there. There's the equation of the tangent line. Okay. All right. Um, at what point or points does the graph of this parabola have horizontal tangent lines? Now, when they say horizontal tangent lines, that means that the slope is equal to 0, right? So set the derivative equal to 0. That's what we're saying. Okay, the slope, your slope finder, is a derivative. So you want to set the derivative equal to 0, solve for those x values. Okay, so the derivative of y with respect to x is 2x plus 4. I want to set that equal, 2x plus 4, equal to 0. And now I simply solve for x, and that's the x-coordinate where I have a horizontal tangent line. Okay, so subtract 4 divided by 2, I would get negative 2. Now it does say at what point or points, so that's just an x-coordinate. To get the actual ordered pair, I probably have to plug this negative 2 back into this equation, right? So the y-coordinate would be uh, negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 minus 1, which would be 4 minus 8 minus 1, uh, negative 4 might be negative 5. Okay, so your ordered pair this is x, this is y, it would be negative 2, negative 5, okay? That would be where I would have that horizontal tangent line, all right? And since we know this is a parabola, that's actually going to be the vertex of this parabola, is really what we found there, okay? That's where a horizontal tangent line would occur, okay? Last, and eh, just about the last thing, okay? So here, there's a question like this, I think, on the on a quiz that we have, um, so it says, it'll give us this cubic function, but it doesn't give us this coefficient here. And then it gives us a line, um, and it says, find the value of k so that the line is tangent to, the, to this function, okay? And so if they want this to be a tangent line, this slope is important. That 6 is really important. So the first thing I would do is say, okay, well, when I take the derivative of this, it's going to, you know, we're talking about a specific point where the slope is equal to 6, Right? We're talking about a, a point on this function where that has a slope of 6. So we want to take the derivative of this, because that's our slope finder, and we know the slope should equal 6. So if I do the derivative of this, you know, multiply the 3 down, I get 3x squared plus k. Now the x disappears because it's x to the first. And then I'm going to set that equal to 6. Right? And then if I solve it for k, I get this expression, 6 minus 3x squared. I have to find the value of k. Right? So I don't quite have enough yet because that's I got two variables there. We need another relationship between these two things. Now we know that the tangent line and the function have to coincide at a specific point. So they have to intersect each other. So we can set this expression equal to this one because a tangent line has to intersect the function. So we set them equal here. And now let's do some algebra. Now, because I have an expression for k that's in terms of x, I'm going to make that substitution. So the 6 minus 3x squared is going right there for that, um, that k value. All right. So that allows me to have an expression that's all in terms of x. Distribute my x through there. I simplify this 6x and that one cancel. Um, I group together my x cubed minus 3x squared. I get negative 2x cubed, or sorry, cubes. And I get negative 2x cubed and divide that out, I get x cubed equals 1, and so x equals 1. Okay, so that's the x value where those two coincide, and now to get the k value, I can plug that back in right here, which I haven't done yet. So I'll have 6 
minus 3 times 1 squared, 6 minus 3, so the k value would have to be 3. All right? So that's how you do it. So your two equations, take the derivative, set it equal to the slope of the tangent line that, that they've given you. Okay? Get an expression for your, your k or whatever they call that missing part of your equation. All right, it's a good expression for that. Then over here, you're going to set them equal to each other because they, they have to intersect. And then take this expression and, and substitute it in so you have all one variable and solve. Okay, last thing. This is some more recognizing the definition of derivative. On the AP exam, they like to pull out questions like this just to confuse you and say, hey, evaluate this limit. And they give you something that looks really crazy, right? But what they want you to do is they want you to recognize that, oh, when you see something like this, it's the limit definition of a derivative of something. If you can figure out what that something is, well, then it's easy to evaluate. And, you know, we have these limit definitions here. You know, so it's good to just to see, oh, yeah, that's that f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. That's what they got here. Well, the f of x is going to be found right here. If they didn't evaluate it at a specific point, it's really easy. It's the second part. Now here you can see, okay, they cubed something, it was the x plus delta x, they squared something and multiplied it by negative 5, and then they took 4 times that x plus delta x minus 7, well that's all, that's what this is right here. So to evaluate that, you got to say, oh, well this is f of x, f of x is x cubed minus 5x squared plus 4x minus 7, and the derivative of that is going to be exactly what this limit is. So all I got to do is find that, take its derivative, that's my answer, okay? because that's exactly what they're saying. They're saying, if I find this limit, that means it's equal to the, the f prime of x, right? Well, f of x is here. f prime is real easy to do once I, once I have f of x listed, okay? Um, another example here, and this one they've already put in a point, but this one would probably look more like, there was a mistake, they had a c, a c there, that should have been an h. But basically, since they did it at a specific point, you know, they've got, f of c plus h, I guess we'd say f of c plus h minus your f of c all over h, and the limit as h approaches 0 there. But really, they're just doing it at a specific point. Well, it's a square root function. You know, your f here is, is a square root function. And so, you know, you're, you're evaluating something there, but it's just the square root of that something. And because they, they kind of give it to you here, that c is the 9, and then you'd have a square root of 9 put back in there again. And so that's why that's a 3. So it's just square root of x in general would be your function. So if you do the derivative of square root of x, remember we did that one before, that's the same as x to the 1 half, right? So its derivative, you multiply 1 half down, you, you know, so if I were doing f prime of that, you'd have 1 half x to the negative 1 half, which is the same as 1 over 2 times root x, because you'd move x to the 1 half back down again. So that's what we'd have here. f prime of x would be 1 over 2 root x. And then if we're evaluating it at that specific point, which we know c is 9 in this, because it shows up there, and then the square root of 9 is there, we could plug that in and get 1 sixth. Okay. One more, which is a similar thing, it's the sine function. Okay, so we're going to see, oh, it's sine of x, and they evaluated the second half of it here, sine of pi over 3. Okay, well, if f of x is sine of x, f prime is cosine, and then we're going to evaluate that at pi over 3. The cosine of pi over 3 would be 1 half. Okay, but it's just, it's recognizing what function is it, listing that, doing its derivative, and then if it is at a specific point, you're going to see that point right there where I, where I circled it, you know, just like here. There, you're going to see that x value, 9, was right there. That's where we have to evaluate it. Okay, that is it for the second part of 2.2.